Map work should not feel as though the weight of the world is weighing on your shoulders. Map work is fun if you only know where to look and how to interpret. You need to know how to work with the maps and as well as to read them. Let's have a look at the various map symbols. With map symbols, you need to know how these symbols are represented on topographical maps. This will help you with your interpretation. Let's have a look at the following photos and how they are represented on maps. There we have our national freeway, our benchmark, railway, and a bridge. Here we have a water tower in blue because it resembles water. We then have our wind pump. A communication tower looks as follows and then we have our trigonometrical station and remember the number below the 887,9 represents the height in meters. The 72 in this example will represent the number of the trigonometrical station. A row of trees, cultivated land, power line, and a cemetery. Over here we have our place of worship. It is indicated by K and that has reference to the Afrikaans word Kak. We then have our dam wall, our coastal rocks and our international boundary. Another word that is derived from Afrikaans is store and that will be represented by a W that stems from the Afrikaans word Vanko. We then have a reservoir, our built up area as well as an excavation. Over here we have a perennial river as well as our non-perennial river. Very easy to distinguish between the two on a map. A perennial river, water flowing right through the year, therefore no break in the river line on your map. A non-perennial river only flows during seasonal times, therefore you will have your broken blue line on your maps. Our protected area, and then our lighthouse and marine beacon indicated by the red star. Moving on to our map skills. With regards to direction, we can be asked to provide the distance from Safari Ostrich Farm, underlined in red, to the Oatsorn Aerodrome, the diggings, Sierkogat, as well as Trigonometrical Station 313. It is important to know how height is represented on topographic maps. Contour lines, trigonometrical stations, spot heights, as well as benchmarks can be used. When working with coordinates, it's important to remember that South Africa is located south of the equator and east of the Greenwich Meridian. Therefore, your latitudinal coordinates will always be south and your longitudinal coordinates will always be east. Remember, one degree is 60 minutes and the minute blocks are located in the margins on your map. If we have to determine the coordinates of spot height 1572, we will start by drawing a pencil line from the feature right through our margin. We will have to repeat that and also read off our longitudinal coordinates. The coordinates for spot height 1572 will be read as 26 degrees and 46 minutes south and 29 degrees and 1 minute east. Let's add the seconds. If we have to determine the exact coordinates of trigonometrical beacon 97, we will again start with drawing a pencil line right through our margin. We now need to divide our minute block 
in two seconds. These blue lines are dividing your minute block into increments of 10 seconds. You now determine where your line crosses through the margin and then you have our latitudinal coordinates of 26 degrees, 45 minutes and 12 seconds south. We will do the exact same to determine our longitudinal coordinates. And then we can read our coordinates of 26 degrees, 41 minutes, 12 seconds south and 29 degrees, 0 minutes and 41 seconds east. Let's have a look at our map reference. Now, grade 12s, your map title is your key when drawing up your map reference. The 33 in this title refers to our latitudinal degrees. The 22 refers to our longitudinal degrees. The C in the map title refers to our larger blocks that we have used to divide our one degree by one degree grid block into four smaller blocks of 30 minutes by 30 minutes. It's important to always add your degrees south and degrees east. The A refers to the smaller blocks A, B, C, D and those are 15 minutes by 15 minutes squares. It's important to also extend your lines should you be asked to determine the map title of a map west or northwest of the map that you are using. In map work, we can also ask you to determine the direction in which a river flows. Remember, our rivers flow towards the sea. They flow from a high area to a low area, and here you can use your contour lines. Contour lines will always bend upstream. Dam walls are constructed downstream. And tributaries join at an acute angle. Let's have a look at this river. The river flows towards. Our contours bend upstream. Here is another example of contours bending upstream. River flowing from high to low. There you have your spot height of 309 meters, 299 and 286. Rivers join at acute angles. And the dam wall shows downstream. If you are asked in what direction the Stienbras River flows, you can look at the following. You can see that we have the Stienbras Mont referring to the mouth of the Stienbras River. It flows from a height of 300 meters down to 100 meters. The dam wall is downstream. We have tributaries joining at an acute angle. And our contours bend upstream. Let's have a look at orientating our map photo. There you can see the track as well as the school. Another example.
With cross sections, these are the points that you have to follow. Firstly, I'm going to indicate the cross section that I have to draw. I'm then going to place a piece of paper all along that cross section and start marking off various features and heights along that cross section. I will also indicate features such as the M2, the dam, a secondary road, trigonometrical station and the dam further higher up. I will then use those markings on my paper and transfer them onto my cross section. You will then dot all your various heights in order to complete the cross section. Now let's have a look at the various calculations that you will be expected to do. We'll start with distance. When measuring distance, it's important to know that you have to remember all your formulas. If asked to calculate the distance of the national road from A to B, you will use your ruler to determine your map distance. I will then place the distance into the formula using the correct scale. In this example, we're measuring on a topographic map, therefore the scale of 50,000. If you are asked to give your answer in kilometers, you will divide by 100,000. Matrix, it's important to note that sometimes distance can be asked in meters, and then if you've measured in centimeters, you have to convert to meters by dividing by 100. Let's have a look at the following exercise. On this ortho photo, we have a measurement of 3,2 centimeters. I'll place all the information into my distance formula. You can see that my scale has now changed to 10,000. I get an answer of 0 0.32 kilometers, which is 320 meters. Gradient. Gradient is the steepness of a slope, or then the ratio between the vertical height and the equivalent distance. It is important to know how to calculate gradient, as various questions can stem from your calculation, such as why is the road going zigzag over the mountain, and why will it be difficult for engineers to construct a road on that slope. You have to know whether the gradient is too steep or too gentle. Let's have a look at the following example. Our formula for gradient is vertical interval, or your difference in height, over your horizontal equivalent or your distance. In this example, you first calculate the height, 460 meters, you subtract 340 from that to get your difference in height of 120 meters. I then need to determine the distance. Very important, in gradient, everything has to be in meters. Therefore, you have to convert your 2,4 kilometers to meters. I will then place everything in my formula and simplify. My gradient is 1 to 20. And remember, grade 12's gradient is a ratio. Therefore, no units are used. It's important to know how height is represented in order to calculate gradient. Let's recap. Contour lines, trigonometrical stations, spot heights, as well as benchmarks. Let's go over another example. Here we have to calculate the average gradient of the road between 7 and 8 on the orthophoto map. 
we now have to use our contour lines to get our difference in height. Firstly, you'll write the formula. You'll then determine your difference in height. You'll then calculate your distance. So you will put 7,8 centimeters into your distance formula and you'll convert that to 780 meters. Substitute into your formula and there you'll get the ratio of 1 to 31,2. The reason why we have a range is that not everyone will have the exact same measurement. Moving on to area. Area's formula is length times width. In this example, if you have to calculate the area of block X, you are going to first use your length measurement of 5 centimeters to get your answer of 2,5 kilometers. You will then do exactly the same and substitute your breadth measurement into your distance formula. You're then going to place it into your area formula to get the answer of 3,75 kilometers squared. And grade 12s, read your questions very carefully. In some questions, we might ask you to calculate the area in meters squared. The area in this example is taken on a topographic map and just be on the lookout if we ask to calculate the area in meters on the orthophoto map. Magnetic declination. Consider the following when doing magnetic declination. What is our mean magnetic declination? In which direction? In which year is the declination given? What is our mean annual change? In what direction is the average yearly change? And for what year must we calculate the magnetic declination? Grade 12's magnetic declination can be broken up into shorter questions where you can be asked to name the magnetic declination on the map or state what it is. And then also, what is the mean annual change for a certain map? Then, using your answers, they will ask you to calculate magnetic declination. A tip when doing magnetic declination is to draw the information given and this will help you with a mental image to continue with your calculation. Let's do the following example. They provide us with information that in July 2002, the mean magnetic declination is 23 degrees and 53 minutes west. We have a six minute west average annual change. Our first step would be to calculate the difference in years. We will then time 7 by 6 minutes to get 42 minutes west. That will be our total change. If our change is to the west, we will add. If it's to the east, we're going to subtract. We then add the 42 minutes west to the current magnetic declination on the map and that will give us the answer of 23 degrees and 95 minutes west. Immediately you have to see a red flag. We cannot have 95 minutes west. Therefore, our magnetic declination for 2009 will be read as 24 degrees 35 minutes west. Another exercise. Here we have a magnetic declination of 23 degrees and 46 minutes west. Our mean annual change is 4 minutes westward. We will then determine our difference in years, calculate our total change. Because our change is west, we will then add it and this will give us our answer of 23 degrees and 58 minutes west. Magnetic bearing. Magnetic bearing can be calculated with the help of our magnetic declination. 
In this example, they ask us to calculate the magnetic bearing from spot type 97 to trigonometrical station 94. Remember our formula for magnetic bearing is our geographic bearing added to our magnetic declination. With magnetic bearing, you will draw your north line and then connect the two features. You will then take your protractor and read off your measurements of degrees. In this example, our geographical bearing is 192 degrees. We're then going to use our information on magnetic declination to determine the current magnetic declination. We will then add our magnetic declination for 2010 to our measurement of 192 degrees. That will give us our magnetic bearing for 2010 as 218 degrees and 50 minutes. Vertical exaggeration. Vertical exaggeration. A question that appeared in a past paper is why are cross sections exaggerated when they are drawn? And we exaggerate them in order to see the relief of the landscape better. Our formula for vertical exaggeration is our vertical scale over our horizontal scale. With vertical exaggeration, we need to have our horizontal scale and our vertical scale in the same units. The first step is we have to convert our vertical scale to our ratio scale. In this case, our vertical scale will be 1 to 5000. We will place those values into our vertical exaggeration formula. If we then do the math, we will get our answer of 10 times. Now, matrix with area, your answer can be in meters squared or kilometers squared, with distance in meters or kilometers. Our unit for vertical exaggeration is the word times. You can't just stop at 10, you have to write down 10 times. Very important information with regards to your map work. Measure your distances as accurately as possible. You have to know all your formulas. Make sure that you are working on the correct map and therefore using the correct scale. Do not only write down your answer, you have to follow and write down all your steps. Always make use of a calculator. Do not rush, work accurately. Always use the correct unit in your answer. And lastly, make sure that you have worked correctly. Remember, practice makes perfect. Map reading. When reading and interpreting maps, it's almost like reading a book. Just like you get to know your characters in map work, you have to know the different colors on your map as well as what they represent. Knowing all the colors and what they represent on the map will help you to create a mental image. Our contour lines represent our relief, drainage, our infrastructure, our settlements, and our economic activities represented by our agricultural land. All these elements will work together in order to best help you create your mental image. Let's have a look at the following extract of Cirrus. We have our brown, our relief, our drainage, our roads and the railway, our settlement and our economic activities in our agricultural area.
it's important to know your theory in order to answer your map work very well. Map work and your grade 12 syllabus content are almost marrying each other in your map work paper. Let's have a look at climatology. When asked to give evidence as to why the area has a dry climate or receives seasonal rainfall, you can look at the following. Do we have dams in the area? Do they have irrigation schemes? Do they have many non-perennial rivers? And they have furrows. We can also ask you whether it is warmer at A or B. Remember, north will always be at the top of your map. There you have our mountain. And seeing that we are in the southern hemisphere, we have a north-facing slope at A. Therefore, A will be warmer. With interpretations of map, the reasons for cultivation of rows of trees can be as follows. They serve as windbreaks. They reduce soil erosion, as well as for aesthetic purposes. When determining wind direction, should there be a forest fire? Due to a catabatic wind at night, the smoke will blow down the slope. In this area, you can see that we have industries. Right next to the industries, you have areas of West End, Thainsig and Flayview. The pollution from the industries will blow over Flayview before a cold front and over Thainsig just after a cold front. Another question we can ask is which of the runways A or B will be used at BE Airport? They ask us which one will be used to take off before a cold front moves over the airport, as well as which one will be used to land after a cold front moved over the airport. Now, in order to answer this question, it is important to note that planes land and take off against the wind. Before a cold front moves over the airport, And after. Geomorphology. Grade 12s, in your map work paper, we can ask you the different stream orders. Remember, two first order streams, when they meet, they become second order streams. Two second orders will then become a third order and two third order streams becomes a fourth order. Important to note that the river always or the stream always keeps the highest order. If you have a look at the right, three and one remains three. You can be asked to identify the drainage pattern in a certain block or in an area on a topographic map. Remember with our dendritic pattern, it looks like the branches of a tree. To identify a trellis pattern, let's have a look. You have your mountainous areas, your harder rock, and then you have your softer layers where your river will flow. That will be our trellis pattern. Let's have a look at this Google Earth image of a rectangular stream pattern. You can see the igneous rocks with their joints, the river flowing in those joints, and you can see our 90 degree bends. Our tributaries are also joining at a 90 degree angle. Our radial pattern, flowing from a higher area downwards. And let's have a look at the following. In this satellite image, we can ask you the term river capture. 
Then you have two rivers of which one has been captured. We can ask you to identify the following from a map. The captured stream, where the elbow of captured occurred, indicate the captor stream, where the wind gap is, as well as which one will have a misfit stream. In map work, you can also be asked to identify the various courses of a river. In this example, we can see the lower course. Easy to see the level land, barely any contours in this extract. We have the river mouth, a sandbank, our meander, we have a marsh, we have a braided stream, and we have a broad flat plain. Moving on to settlements, rural settlement. Here we can ask whether the area is rural or urban. This is where you have to read your map and look at the amount of agricultural area lots of rural primary activities with secondary activities and tertiary activities. We can also ask you the shape of rural settlements, whereas in this case, the settlement circled in red is situated along a road, therefore linear. Moving on to urban settlements. Let's have a look at the shape of Paul. Again, we look at our relief, the brown on the map, our mountains. We then also have the river. Paul is situated along the river, therefore the shape is linear. Modern Paul is in fact stellar as various activities have moved outwards. Let's have a look at the shape. Rectangular. Grade 12, what's important to note is that these shapes and patterns can also be asked in your map work and you have to apply your theory. With the street patterns, let's have a look at the following. Here we have our grid pattern, which will be found on gentle slopes as well as in older areas. Our irregular pattern will be on steeper slopes, and both of these have got the advantages and disadvantages. Questions will be, why will traffic congestion be more in an area with a grid pattern in comparison to an irregular pattern? When identifying the CVD on a map, let's have a look. You have to have accessibility and highlighted on the slide now will be the roads leading into our CVD. We can ask you to describe the factors that influence the location of industries. This is where your theory and your map work knowledge will marry each other. You need to know the different factors that influence the location of industries, such as level land, and you have to be able to identify these on a map. Access to raw material, availability of water, having a labor force close by, electricity, transport routes, as well as a market. You can also identify the different income areas. Let's have a look at Sparty Town in this extract. Will Smarty Town be a low income or high income? Smarty Town is located right next to industries, next to a railway line, 
as well as next to sewage works. Therefore, one can argue that Smarty Town is a low-income residential area, as higher incomes will not be close to sewage works for the smell, as well as the railway line and the industries for noise pollution. Let's have a look at identifying the rural urban fringe. We have our airport, our race course, our recreational area, sewage dams, a golf course, as well as the shunting yard. You then also have your small holdings. It is important to identify the various features on a map. Looking at the rural urban fringe, you can see your sewage works, your golf course, and your recreational track and showgrounds, your industries, your zone of decay, your CBD, your commercial area, as well as your residential areas. People and their is this area commercial farming or not? And how will you know? It is a large area on the map. Most of the farms have names. We can see the farm boundaries. We have roads for accessibility. And it is an estate. They have water by means of irrigation, in dams, and with a canal. The reasons for the location of an industrial area. Level land. Raw material with the diggings and the agricultural area. Transport. Water availability. Labour and our market. You can be asked to identify the most prominent tertiary activity in an area. If you look at this extract, you have a lot of power lines going off in various directions. Therefore, power supply will be your answer. When looking at the use of dams, Dams can be used for irrigation, drinking water, and recreation. On this extract, irrigation is shown by the canal or the furrow. We have a filtration plant as well as the full flame water treatment plant indicating drinking water. We have our caravan park right next to the dam as well as our full flame nature reserve either sides. Geographic Information Systems or GIS in short. You will find your GIS in both of your geography papers. It will be in question 3 in your map work section of paper 1 and paper 2. What is a GIS? Now Matrix, this question can be asked for two marks. It is a concept and what you need to be able to answer is the following. That it is a computer system of hardware, software and methods used to capture, manage, manipulate, analyze, model and display various data sets. The main purpose of this GIS is to solve planning and management problems. A GIS consists of various components and you have to be able to name these. Hardware, such as your computer screen. Software, your programs. Data, your maps. People and methods. Remote sensing is another term that you have to know. It is the collecting of information about the Earth's surface with sensors on platforms and you are not in physical contact with the earth while you are gathering the information. A spatial object in GIS is a way of representing a physical feature on a map. Then you can see a building, a wind pump, 
an orchard or vineyard, and then also a river. Spatial objects such as the building is represented by points or then a node. The river, a line or an arc. And the orchard, an area or a polygon. When looking at our spatial objects on this extract of a topographic map, you will see that our wind pump as well as our farmstead is represented by the point our river and our roads line, and then our perennial river or the dam, and then the orchard and vineyard will be represented as the area. What is resolution? Now there you can see a very blurred image, and resolution refers to the ability of a remote sensing sensor to create a sharp and clear image. If you ever look at that photo, it's very difficult to identify, is it maybe a person, is it an aerial photo of some agricultural area, or is it a building? If I add the next photo, you will see that it's actually part of a building. And the photo in the background has a higher resolution because we can clearly see the building. Spatial resolution that is high. You will have many pixels. These pixels will be small and therefore objects can be easily recognized. If your resolution is low, you will have less pixels and those pixels will be large and hence we will struggle to recognize our objects. Our various GIS data types will be spatial data, this will be all geographic features or objects, and both are natural or man-made. Our attribute data will be characteristics or description and information about the geographic objects. Our spatial data structures, our raster, you are familiar with the term, and those will be our pixels, our vector is our point, line and area. Representing spatial data structures on vector or raster. So with our vector representation, our building will be represented by the two dots and the raster, you will only see two of the small squares colored in. The line feature, the road, will be various points connected with the line. With the area feature, the plantation, you can clearly see that you have more blocks that are um, colored in and the more pixels you have, the more crisp and clear your image of the plantation will be. GIS data layers, all spatial data, whether it is vector data or raster data, are shown in layers. Each layer represents a single entity or a theme. These questions have been asked in various papers where candidates are asked to identify the data layer um, used to determine various problems. Now, Great 12, an example would be if you have to construct an airport or a landing strip, what are the layers that GIA specialists will have to look at? Now, if you look at an airport, you need level land and you need wide open spaces. So the data layer that we will be using is topography. You need to know if I have a level land because planes can't land in areas where our gradient is high. You also can add infrastructure because planes can't land close to residential areas. When we look at data manipulation and analysis, data can be manipulated and analyzed by a geographical information system. With the information, we can transform one map projection to another. We can convert data from raster or vector or vice versa, and you can have an interpolation between points. 
When we look at data integration, it involves the combination of two or more data layers in order to create a new one. Buffering. Grade 12s in map work, you can be asked to identify a certain zone at a different distance from a feature. Later on in the slideshow, I will go over an example. With buffering, you can be asked to create a noise buffer next to certain roads or then safety buffers for dangerous areas. If you look at the content that you have to study, in your paper 2, if you have a map with various silos, you can be asked to create a buffer zone around the silos and indicate how many farmers can make use of that specific silo. Let's GIS. On this extract of a topographic map, you have examples of points, lines and areas. Our road is the line, cultivated areas the area, and then the school will be examples of points. Now they ask us to use both a vector and raster data structures to show a road, the two schools and the cultivated fields. Our vector, remember, points, lines, areas. And there you can see the road is indicated by the line. Our two schools are the two points. And then our areas, our cultivated fields, is indicated with the area. Looking at the raster data, we now have to add pixels and there you can see the road, the schools as well as our area and remember grade 12s the more of these pixels that I have and the smaller they are the better I can define those various features. Possible attributes now remember, attributes are descriptions or characteristics. Of the hospital, we can get the name, the street address, postal address, the number of beds, and the number of doctors. So there's an example of an attribute table for the hospital. Name, address, number of doctors, number of nursing staff, and the number of beds. How do we use GIS? GIS questions relate to analysis. You can be asked to determine, identify and name which data layers to use in solving a problem. You can be asked to identify factors or issues that may play a role or relate to the problem. And then those data layers will be needed in your analysis to ultimately get to the solution. Okay, 12, here I have an extract from paper two in June, 2022. They ask us to refer to the image of Ring Road West located in block A3 on the ortho photo map. When looking at question 3.3.1, the question reads as follows, is the image of Ring Road West classified as vector or raster data. And let's have a look on our question paper on the photo given. It means it's a photo. We use pixels. Therefore, our answer is raster data. They ask us to provide a reason of support for our answer. The image of Ring Road West is a photo. At question 3.3.3, they ask us why is the number of lanes on Ring Road West referred to as attribute data? So if someone asks you a question, how many lanes do you have on Ring Road West? You are asking them to describe Ring Road West. So now, why are the number of lanes referred to as attribute data? It serves as a description of the size of the road. Further on in the question paper, 
Candidates were referred to blocks A5 and B5. The question states to define the term buffering. I've added an extract of the area that candidates were referred to. If you look at the term buffering, it is creating a zone around a geographic feature containing locations that are within a specified distance. Those distances can range from 250 to 500 meters, even a few kilometers. And that area that you buffer is referred to as the buffer zone. Question 3.3.5, they asked why is buffering northwest of Union in block C5 necessary? Now here I've added an extract of block C5. If you ever look at the area northwest of Union, you can see that we have a marsh and a flay. Why would buffering then be necessary to protect the marsh and the flay or to prevent flooding? Grade 12s, you can even add to prevent pollution of the marsh and the flay. When you use GIS, you can have information about various plots and the cost of them, distance to other shops, if a new shop that will be established in the area will have enough clients to support the shop, um, can it be seen as a central place and what will its sphere of influence be? An example about floods is if they give you the various rainfall figures, they might ask you to create a buffer zone above the 50 year flood line to see if development will be able to take place. They can ask you questions such as will agricultural land or will a protected area be influenced if there is a flood above the 50 year flood line. With regards to crime, you can have data sets about the type of crime. Is it a mugging, a smash and grab? What are the locations, the time and how frequent the crime occurred? Telecom and terrain analysis. Do we have relief, um, our contours? Is there intervisibility? Will we have signal strength? Uh, if you have a look at your settlement module, they can ask you if you can develop a new residential neighborhood. And remember, telecom, our Wi-Fi, our cell phone signal, and therefore, if we do have interference, we won't be able to have a strong signal strength. If our contour lines are too closely spaced and we do not have roads, it will be difficult for telecom developers to establish their towers on certain terrain. Let's have a look at application of GIS in a paper two in November 2014. There you have an extract of a topographic map with roads, agricultural land, and a marsh and a flay. The question asked to create a buffer zone of 250 meters around the marsh or the flay area. Now, grade 12s, remember, 250 meters in reality will be a measurement of 5 millimeters on a topographic map with a scale of 1 to 50,000. What you have to do is you have to demarcate the area around the marsh and the flay and then measure your five millimeters on either side of the feature to create your buffer zone. In grade 12s, your drawings will have to be in pencil and it's always wise to add a key and shade your buffer zone. All the best and good luck for your exam. Remember, have a great latitude to learning.